Greetings, scholars. Dr. Williams here. Back with another installment of the social media marketing lecture series. This time, chapter nine, social commerce. Hang in there, it's not so bad. I promise. So we're going to be operating that bottom left-hand quadrant today as we, you know, we've moved around uh, throughout the textbook. And you see that they, they break out <laughs> the, the E on commerce. <laughs> that figure has been goofed up. Uh, customer relationship management service, retailing, sales, human resources. Uh, anyway, that's where we're going to be. That's where we're going to be operating for chapter nine, social commerce, which is different than e-commerce, right? Doing any kind of business uh, over the internet, we could call it e-commerce. Social commerce is a part of e-commerce. It's not the same. It uses social shopping, different channels, different tools. And that bottom bullet uh, enables people, networks of buyers and sellers to participate actively in the marketing and selling of products in online marketplaces and communities. So it's a subset of, of e-commerce because we can just go to target.com and we can do some e-commerce. But we're going to apply that to uh, social commerce involving social media. So social shopping is the active participation in the consumer decision-making process, which we're going to talk about in a, in a moment, which you've also learned about in at least principles of marketing, if not, uh, or other courses, how people work through that in their mind, you know, traditionally. And uh, second bullet, it refers to consumers' behavior as they use social media to make purchase decisions. So definitionally, social commerce is the commercial application of tools that you fool around with all the time, social media, to drive the acquisition and the keeping of customers and how that works or how it can work. So some key elements involved in social commerce Ratings and reviews, everyone's familiar with those, whether you do them or not. Do you only do them when you're unhappy with the purchase, or do you do it when you're happy or satisfied and unsatisfied? Curated merchandise, merchandise, I don't know why I said that all country sounding. Uh, whether you've, uh, on Pinterest, you've put them on a board or or you've led a, uh, or the Amazon uh, AI expert recommender system. Uh, maybe you do it that way. And then we've got shopping applications and venues. In other words, the how and where uh, can we get it done? So in this little example, uh, I'm on uh, Pinterest, not Pinterest. Let's say I'm on Instagram. I could be on Pinterest, but I'm just, I'm not on Pinterest. I have an account, but I'm not on Pinterest. So uh, an ad pops up, you know, or words with friends or whatever. And uh, reminds me to visit uh, a storefront for 1-800-Flowers. Maybe I was looking for flowers or recently sent flowers or Mother's Day is coming up, so it's going to remind me that I have a need. But I've got a split because I've got a meeting or something. So I might just use the chat bot to order at 1-800-Flowers. Uh, and then after I buy, it says, uh, you know, can we share that to your Facebook page or uh, Instagram? And I say, sure, because I want people to know that I'm thinking about Mother's Day way ahead of time. And then somebody might see that, who I know, and they 
they like me, let's say they respect my opinions on things, and that might spur them to do it. Uh, or I might get another ad myself. So this chapter nine mentions chat bots quite a bit. They don't appeal to me personally, but it could be the demographic that I'm in. I haven't done a lot of research on that, but uh, they're not my favorites, although I use them from time to time. But rarely do I get the right answer of what I'm looking for. And, they, and I have to click on the box. So, did this answer your question? I go, no. And I move on. So if you remember from principles of marketing, or like I said, another marketing course, the traditional consumer decision-making process kind of runs in this order. Not all the time, but typically. So I have a problem recognition. I have a, I go out and I have a uh, flat tire or it's going flat and they're old anyway. And I say, you know, I'm going to need a new tire. So I search around for information on who's open, uh, how long will it take me to get there? Maybe I'm things going flat really quick. Maybe I'm searching for pricing, availability, uh, making an appointment, whatever. And I come up with three places and then I evaluate those three and the tires and the, all the different components. And then I go there and make the purchase and get the tire. And then I'm either happy with what I did neutral or dissatisfied with what I did. That's the post purchase evaluation. So I'm happy with it. Or maybe I have some cognitive dissonance because I paid too much for the tire, you know, a week later, you know, I, uh, not happy because I forgot that we were going to sell that car or whatever. So I should have put a recap on it or something. That's the typical, consumer decision-making process. It doesn't work that way all the time. If you're standing in a checkout line at, at Kroger and you just grab a Twix bar, well, you didn't go through all that. You may have said, saw the Twix bar and went, you know, I'd like to have one of those. And you just buy it because you have experience with it. So we're going to talk about heuristics and shortcuts and things like that. But so if we apply that to social commerce, commerce via social media platforms or communities, uh, that first step, product recognition, can, like we said before, uh, with the 1-800-Flowers, that could, an ad could trigger that I need or want that, reminded me. Uh, my friends all seem to be uh, buying a, a Roomba, and they seem to love them. You know, they're endorsing them, even though if they're not saying I endorse this, but. Uh, curated images, uh, you know, I'm using Waze and I'm traveling. I stop at a red light and it says, uh, did you know there's a Dunkin' Donuts on this corner? And, uh, and I go, oh, great. That's location-based promotion. Or participatory commerce. I really want a brand new uh, motorized uh, wagon uh, to haul my stuff out to the beach and, uh, I see a Kickstarter where I can chip in and be the first ones to buy one and the guy's making. So that's, that's taking the traditional stage one of problem recognition. Again, that recognition is screwed up again. I don't know why. Uh, from a social commerce perspective. Stage two, information, informati on search. Information search. Uh, yeah, I've used my tire example earlier. Uh, we can do it using social media with, uh, I might just post a question to all buddies. Hey, uh, what's, the, what's, what's the best kind of tire to buy? Or where's the best tire place that you like? I can go to Yelp and look up tire stores and uh, <laughs> use those, uh, the recommendations and reviews and things. I can search for pricing information uh, via user groups if I want to, wish lists, uh, 
you know, I see people like a lot of people have wish lists and I'm buying Christmas gifts. I go, a lot of people are looking for this. I'll go back to a room. I wonder why they want that. And then again, conversational commerce or involving chat bots. So I'm going to spend a little time on this stage two to discuss the zero moment of truth. If we, if we go back before the internet or before widespread usage of the internet, we have a, I'll use my tire example. Uh, I've got a flat tire. Okay. So I, I do some information searching and my first moment of truth would have been I'm at the tire store and I'm looking at different tires or I'm at the grocery store. Let's say your need is for food and you're at the grocery store looking at all the different varieties of rice, whatever you think you want it. And then the second moment of truth traditionally was your experience with the product or the service. So the internet and in this case, social commerce has created what scholars now often refer to as the zero moment of truth because I may be doing a lot of information shopping uh, through apps on a laptop, desktop, reading about it, uh, quizzing friends via social media or email even. So my first, my zero moment of truth or actually my first moment of truth may be way before I get to Kroger or to the tire store. So it's important for businesses to make sure that they're, that the, the right information about their goods and services and even hours of operation and their methods of payment uh, are available because people are looking for that before they set foot in a store to make the buy. And that's referred to more and more regularly as the zero moment of truth, which has stuck itself within this, you know, more traditional order of things. So ratings and reviews, do they matter? Sure they do. This slide just points out why they matter. Should the ratings and reviews be uh, adapted so they're easily seen and used and operated on mobile phones? Yes, because that's uh, smartphones, because that's the way people are more and more accessing the internet. 82% seek out negative reviews as an indicator of authenticity. What does that mean? Well, if you're looking at a product and product review on Amazon or wherever, uh, and everything's positive, this is the greatest thing in the world. There's nothing wrong with this thing. It tends to lose some of its source credibility because you know, the world's full of complainers, no matter how great it is. Somebody, uh, is going to complain about it. You know, if they got a free $20 bill, I wish that was a 50, you know, you know, those people, uh, 70% of mobile shoppers are more likely to purchase if the site includes reviews and 66%, which actually I believe that's a little bit higher, read one to 10 reviews before making a purchase. The average is six. Most people will look at six reviews if they're, if they haven't purchased it before, aren't familiar with the brand, uh, that type of thing. So they're important. They're an important driver in moving people through the consumer purchase decision. So companies and firms should make sure that they have the ability for people to review uh, and write commentary and that it's easy to do. It doesn't take me a lot of time because you'll get more positive ratings if you make it easy on me. If I have to go to some other site and type something up, 
<clears throat> even if I'm tickled, uh, extremely happy and joyous with the product or service, uh, I'm probably not going to do it because, you know, like everybody, my time is short. So transparency in reviews. If, if you curate your review section too much and make sure that your negative reviews are, so you clean those out. You lose source credibility, and then your review portion of your site is discounted, and people will spread the word. And so it's better not to even have one than to have one that you that people think you uh, manipulate. It should be easy to see whether uh, somebody is in, has been incentivized to post a review. Uh, you, that shouldn't be hidden uh, so you see incentivized reviewers are less likely than non incentivized reviewers to give a one star rating and four times less likely to be critical in a review in other words if you leave us leave a rating then uh, we'll send you a ten dollar gift card off your next purchase well if you buy it on on regularly every month then you might feel a uh, which we're going to talk about the psychology of influence later, but uh, the rule of reciprocity, you might feel compelled to leave a positive rating because they're, they promised you something back. All you have to do is post it. So uh, review forums are, I would say, necessary for social commerce. Source credibility and transparency, though, is important. If if you don't have that, then you're better not even. Then you're better off not even to have a reviews a review section. Transparency is the best medicine for that. Even if it's bad, if somebody leaves something bad, you have to get on there and address it. But don't take it off. All right. So if we move when we move past the information search and we move, we're evaluating the alternatives. We can do a lot of things. You know, you're if you have a cartwheel app on your phone at Target, um, you can use that. Uh, people will price shop. You know, if they're buying a big ticket item at Best Buy, big ticket electronic item, they might price shop while they're in there. Uh, recommendation agents, those are like Amazon, you know, people that buy this, uh, oftentimes buy this. Uh, and, you know, you go, you know what? I didn't even know that was available. I will do that. Sorting by popular items. You're searching for something at Lowe's and you can filter it by price or popularity or things that are on sale. And again, ratings and review forums. So with respect to social commerce, those are all, they're different tools. You may use those for every purchase, but say an older person in their 70s may not use these tools because they may not be interested in buying using social commerce vehicles but uh it makes it much easier for uh, you and me stage four we make the buy we've decided upon what we're going to do and we're going to purchase the good or service and we can do it a bunch of different ways uh, we can you know buy a coupon off a uh, Groupon and use it at the car wash we can buy right in the Facebook app the IG app uh, snapchat links social shopping malls peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces you know, Etsy, buy a necklace from somebody that makes them, or um, I'm trying to think of the other one. I just, somebody just sent me something from it, and I made the comment that I don't, I don't use it to shop, but this person does. It sends me stuff from there all the time, which now will come to me in a minute, but I shouldn't have deviated from my uh, notes, I guess. But it's the other consumer to consumer network which again I thought that might help me think of it but uh, 
No. So we make the purchase and then we have the post purchase evaluation. So we're looking at it and we think it's good. And then, you know, we see some people posted comments, but you know, after you own this thing for six months, the battery won't charge at all. And you see about 40 of those and you go, uh Oh, maybe I should take that back. Uh, We've got submission of ratings and reviews on review sites and the retailer website. Reviews and product experience. See, so this takes the post purchase evaluation into the area of social commerce via social media channels or communities versus your neighbor saying he bought a lawnmower and it's great. All right. That would be uh, one to one, uh, person to person word of mouth uh, but as you know people now if they use social commerce social media to buy things they may also post there for good and ill so we talk about the third moment of truth talked about the zero one again so we'll just I'm going to highlight this again so we have some sort of stimulus that causes us to start the journey I used a flat tire or uh, we want to have uh, a hamburger cookout, so we need some ground beef or whatever. We go to the grocery store. So the zero moment of truth happens even before you get to the store. You find something or are made aware of something or you look around on the Internet and you see some things before you even get to Kroger for the ground beef or to NTB for the tire you have had your zero moment of truth. First moment of truth, you're in the store and you're looking at the offerings. So then we buy and suppose we're really tickled with it. I mean, well, as a personal example, uh, I have several iRobot products, vacuums, mops, things like that. I'm a big fan. I don't carry on about them uh, too much, but if asked to, I will review and rate and it's always high because I love them. If you can turn somebody into an advocate for your good or service, either by the product being real good, the process being very good, uh, and they advocate for you, there's a lot of source credibility in that much better than an ad that the company puts out and you share it on social media networks. And instead of going one to one, you know, over the fence, telling your neighbor about how good this is, you might be going one to the world, right? One to a thousand, uh, depending on how much you get shared in things. So some best practices, be authentic. Don't curate out the, uh, negative comments leave them in there. You should address them, but leave them in there. And if possible on the review site, uh, let the other readers know that, you know, I'm sorry that happened and we've addressed that and you should come back. Transparency. If you're paying somebody to do it, you should note that. Let people rate the value of the reviews. Like this is a good review. You know, sometimes people will go way down a wormhole on a product. Uh, encourage customers to review, to review. The other side of that is make it easy on people to review, preferably one or two clicks. Uh, I find the Uber Eats app to be really easy uh, to review. And I use it probably on every delivery. I can't think of one I, I haven't. Uh, there probably are some, but. Uh, not only encourage people to do it, but, uh, you know, you don't even have to offer an incentive if it's easy. Reciprocity. Thank people for their review, especially if they took a lot of time to talk about it. And the point I've already talked about infectiousness, make it easy to share reviews. Make it easy to for me to review, make it easy for somebody to share mine if they want to. 
And then if you're operating, if you got a good operation with a good product or service or customer service, whatever it is, then, then the word spreads like wildfire with a high amount of source credibility. So how can you build a good, strong base of good reviews? You can educate people, you know, via short videos, things they can watch, things that your product will do, things that you'll do for them, if it's a service, whatever. Find influencers or people who are likely to share opinions and uh, try to target them if you can, you know, your high frequency users. Uh, tools to make it easy. Don't make it hard. Don't take me to another website where I have to log in to something and write something. I'm not going to do it. Find out how people like to share, when and where. And then you can, uh, you can target those areas, you know, by asking your customers to, you know, scan a code and do it. Uh, but not on some weird site that nobody goes to. And then listen and respond. If it's bad, respond. If it's neutral, ask them what you can do to make it better. Uh, and if they really love the place and went crazy about it, thank them for it. Tell them to appreciate their business. So let's talk about the psychology of influence. Right? We want to, if we're using social media to try to win customers, you should know a few things about that might influence people to work their way through that, uh, the processes that they do in order to purchase. What really motivates people? You might think you know what motivates them, but a little market research would really help you narrow that down. And uh, the bottom bullet the guy with the gears in his brain mentions bounded rationality and information overload. Uh, bounded rationality is, you know, I know what I know. So don't confuse me with a bunch of stuff that I don't know. Cause then I'll just get confused. I might, which might result in, uh, inaction. And, uh, if I get, I know what I know and the information I get, if it's a lot, I'm going to use a heuristic or a shortcut. The two they mentioned here, satisficing and thin slicing. Satisficing is uh, either because of time or money or bounded rationality, or I just had too much information. I'm going to take just the amount of time that I need to satisfy my top primary issues and then I'm going to make a decision. It might not be the best decision, but because it's real expensive to get the next few pieces of information or because there's just so many to get, I'm going to concentrate on whatever price, delivery and brand, right? So that could hurt a brand that's not as, not as well known or has, it has some other, uh, benefits that that I'm not working down the line to get thin slicing is similar in that uh, that's another shortcut where you just peel off just enough information to make a choice all right so we're going to ignore most of the information that they have they have too much we're going to ignore it and we're going to pick us a couple that are most salient to us that we think uh, or we think the most salient to us, and then we're going to make a decision. Again, you don't want to confuse the consumer, and you want to find out what's important to them and what will they understand, right? So, a little more in depth. We have social proof. A lot of us make decisions just based on what our friends and family uh, do in the same situation, right? Whenever, uh, their car is broken, they always take it to this garage. So we will just do the same thing. All right. 
that's one thing that influences people. Authority. If I view someone as having uh, excessive knowledge or a lot of knowledge in a certain area, uh, I am going to ask them, or if I don't ask them, they just share information with me. It's going to be very persuasive to me. That's the reason that you see people um, in commercials, you know, they use experts to vouch for their product, right? That's the, they're using the uh, authority of that individual to influence the consumer. Affinity, we can call that that we like something, right? We like the Atlanta Falcons, so we're more prone to buy Atlanta Falcons stuff. Uh, and people tend to follow and emulate people that they find uh, you know, attractive or for whatever reason, if you, um, you know, if you're, if you have a very fashionable friend, they're always sharp looking and they, <clears throat> you know, they wear a certain type or brand of clothing, then it might influence you no matter what kind of commercial messages you get bombarded with. It might convince you to also buy that style brand, whatever. Scarcity. There's only three left at this price. That's scarcity. And you see people use that uh, a lot. When you tell somebody they can't have something, even if they didn't really think they wanted it anyway, well, there's only two left. Now I want it. Uh, that can motivate people. Reciprocity, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, the reason you see so many companies saw an ad for auto trader the other day on television where they'll bring a car to you out of something you like on auto trader and you can, uh, they'll bring it to your house. You can test drive it and for a couple days and decide whether you want to buy it. Well, the feeling of someone letting you try something before you buy, it's like they gave you something. And it's been shown that consumers in their mind want to, uh, reciprocate and do business with those people. Um, so that's the reason you see a lot of sampling programs or if you're, you know, if you're in Costco or something and they're whatever, giving out samples of a cheese log or something you, and you're hungry. So you eat a bunch of it <laughs> and then they go, yeah, it's, it's right here. You can buy some. And you go, well, I just ate a bunch of it for free. I feel like I ought to buy some. You might just pick it up and then go around the corner and leave it. But, uh, that's the concept of reciprocity, uh, influencing consumers and then consistency. Buyer's remorse is a concept that most people are familiar with. Uh, the marketing term uh, for that is, uh, or the psychology term and marketing term for that is cognitive dissonance. You know, let's say, I. Like I said earlier, I bought a tire and, and I get home and I realize, now nah, I shouldn't have spent that much money on that tire. I shouldn't have done business with that guy because I found out later that he's a jerk. And, you know, he, he divorced my sister or something, whatever. And then I'm, I have a conflict in my mind that I'm, I bought the tire and I, I shouldn't have bought it for whatever the reasons are. We want to try to uh, be consistent. Consumers do in their beliefs and their actions and uh, and that can influence a consumer. For example, let's say that, uh, you know, you're, you know, you don't believe in gambling for whatever reason. Your grandmother told you it was bad or whatever, but you really like playing the lottery. You want to. So, You've got these two things in your mind and you say, well, you know what though? I'm just helping education by playing the lottery. So now I'm back in balance. I'm consistent. I'm a firm believer in education. That's the reason I'm playing the lottery, not because I love to gamble. Uh, so those things, that's the authors call it the psychology of influence. Those are things that influence consumers. And there's a, a chart that's not really the best, but I've included it. I've included it here. 
uh, you could see like uh, geolocation promotions. You know, you're in a, you pull into a strip center and your phone goes off and it says, uh, you know, for the next hour, you know, whatever. Product A or service A is on sale for half price. Uh, they're using scarcity. And uh, consistency, we know that you, we know that, you know, you've bought, this certain particular brand of shoe before and you know whenever you buy one we give two we give a pair of socks to the local homeless shelter uh so they can use those two they can use others but primarily in this chart saying the geolocation promotions would make most use of uh those two uh and you can go through and you know Let's say ask your network. You say, "Hey, I'm looking to, I'm looking to buy a whatever, uh, a new suit. Uh, what do you like to shop? Where should I shop?" And then somebody that you uh, admire and you think they're a sharp dresser and smart and know where to do it, uh, they they give you uh, their favorite place, their favorite haberdashery. And you've got a consistency in your mind because you know you know that guy and been friends for years and he's sharp and smart and there you get. But you can work yourself through this chart. It truly really should be designed a little bit better. But I did include it because it does have some good parts to it, even though it could be less convoluted. Anyway, that is chapter nine and uh, social commerce. And I'll see you back for the next one. Study hard.